What are atoms? How do they look like? Let's take a look into what we have learned about them and how we think of them. The history of the atom. This is the planetary system that I already showed in the video about the Rutherford model of the atom because the Bohr model doesn't change any of that and it looks essentially the same. The Bohr model contains one change, however, that is far more revolutionary than uh, whether it has a nucleus or it has electrons orbiting. And that change is in how it works. You see, Bohr turned the atom into a quantum object. The model was the first hint that made people realize how strange, how different and new this new branch of physics, this quantum physics, was going to be. The spectroscopy riddle. Light can be at least partially understood as being an electromagnetic wave. And it turns out that the different frequencies of this light wave appear to us as different colors. The lowest visible frequency is red, then yellow and green and so on and so on and so on. What we perceive as white light from, for example, the sun or a light bulb is actually a combination of all colors, which you can see in a rainbow or with a prism. This range of different colors is called a spectrum and the study of spectra is called spectroscopy. And as people started to look into the spectra of different light sources, they soon found something that they didn't understand and that nobody could explain at the time. If you use light from a gas discharge, like a neon tube or a fluorescent lamp, and split it up into its components, you don't get all colors, but only a small number of sharp lines, a so-called line spectrum. Also, if you shine white light through such a gas, those exact same lines suddenly go missing from the spectrum. Furthermore, it turned out that these line spectra were different for each element, to the extent that you could use the line spectrum to identify each element like a fingerprint. So clearly something strange was going on here and it had to do something. It had to. Have to. <laughs> had to do something with the atoms of the different elements and how those atoms interact with light. A bit later, resourceful people even managed to piece together mathematical formulas that would correctly describe the spectral lines. But these were purely empirical, purely a, a description of what people saw, not an explanation of what was going on. So if anything, that only deepened the mystery behind the spectral lines. Bohr's postulates. Niels Bohr was a student of Ernest Rutherford and his atomic model was firmly based on Rutherford's. As a quick recap, atoms have a nucleus with positive charge, which makes up almost the entire mass of the atom. It also has an atomic shell made up of the negatively charged electrons that orbit the nucleus. The shell is about 100,000 times larger than the nucleus. The most pressing problem with this model, however, is that according to electrodynamics, which was perfectly known at the time, a charge going around the nucleus, so uh, moving on a circular path, should radiate away all its energy and do this extremely quickly within just fractions of a second. So electrons orbiting something should not be stable, it should not be possible. And the key to solving this was what Bohr called stationary orbits. These were orbits with a specific distance from the nucleus that were stable, that were defined as being stable. Now Bohr could not explain how or why they would be stable and by what mechanism, and he freely admitted that. His whole argument was, look, obviously atoms are stable. They do exist, we can observe them, so obviously at the atomic scale there must be new physics that we don't understand yet, we don't know yet, but those must allow for stable orbits. That's the first postulate by Bohr. There are stationary orbits which are stable, i.e. unknown physics prevents electrons from radiating. Bohr did not claim that any orbit was stable, just that some stable orbits would exist. And he also gave the condition for stability. Bohr's second postulate, 
only those orbits are stationary where the angular momentum of the electron is a multiple of Planck's constant h-bar. L is equal to n times h-bar. There is actually a more intuitive version of this by de Broglie. The matter wave of the electron must fit onto the full orbit and form a standing wave. Now this is a more pleasant explanation, but it only came 10 years after the Bohr model was published. Either way you do it, the atom was now quantized, meaning only very specific orbits are allowed and specific angular momenta are possible. Uh, this quantization was somewhat forced and from the outside, but still. One further consequence of this was is that every orbit has an energy attached to it. The new thing was that as the orbits were quantized, so were the energies. So an atom could only have specific energy levels. And if you have an electron at, at one energy level, at one orbit, and it goes to another orbit, then this difference of energy has to go somewhere. Bohr's third postulate. And this is Bohr's explanation of how atoms interact with light. This difference in energy between orbits, this quantum of energy is radiated off by a photon according to Ea minus Eb is equal to h times nu. Conversely, if an electron requires energy to climb to a higher orbit, this energy must be supplied by a photon first. And this photon must have the exact energy necessary to jump from A to B. Let's take a step back here. What I just said was the description of a quantum jump. An electron is in one stationary orbit, gives off a photon, and is immediately lands into a lower stationary orbit. This is a completely abrupt process. The electron is in one state, disappears and appears in a new state. There is no in-betweens. And that's what a quantum jump is. This was finally an explanation for the line spectra we were discussing before. The light emission is always with the same frequency because the stationary states are fixed and the Bohr process explains both emission and absorption of light of these exact frequencies. Furthermore, Bohr could derive the empirical formulas that were already known directly from his model. And he could calculate the Rydberg constant, and he could calculate the energies of at least the simplest atoms like hydrogen. He also correctly predicted the spectral lines that were outside the visible light spectrum that nobody had measured before. And for a model based on just a small number of simple assumptions, that was quite a lot. The last stop before the quantum world. So on the one hand, Bohr's model was a great predictive success, but on the other hand, it only could be applied to the very simplest of atoms. So it showed what was possible, but it also showed that we were still lacking the formalism, the, the, the correct math to fully go there. The greatest merit of the model certainly was uncovering the quantum nature of atoms, showing that there were some things that only occurred in very discrete steps, in quantized steps. Steps so small that in our everyday world we just don't realize them. It was heralding that, at, at the scale of atoms and beyond, completely new and very weird physics was hiding and waiting to be discovered. And this door was finally pushed open a decade later by Bohr's student Werner Heisenberg. Yeah.